What is going on YouTube? Andrew Miller, Park LaCour, Shane Black from HookemHeadlines.com and the Hook'em Horn Show. Uh, we're coming back at you all today, uh, second day in a row uh, with the video for y'all. Um, you know, we're recording this on Tuesday night, so uh, on tonight we'll have uh, our, you know, dissecting some big storylines, over, big overreactions, things like that uh, this week and then coming out of the Kansas State game. But today we're uh, looking at the TCU game this weekend. Uh, number seven, Texas faces TCU at Amon G. Carter Stadium in Fort Worth this weekend. It's under the lights in primetime, 6.30 p.m. kickoff. Um, but every single game remaining for Texas this regular season is, is in primetime. Um, Iowa State game is going to be a night game in Ames. And then Texas Tech, you got a night game on Black Friday at DKR. And so um, Texas back in that primetime slot again, like you, I, I feel like, like you saw a lot, what, 12, 15 years ago. And so, um, you know, this TCU game, it's, I think, probably the second most difficult game remaining on the schedule. Um, I think the Iowa State game probably poses the biggest test for Texas among what's left on the schedule. But, um, yeah, th this TCU team, you know, outside of potentially playing in a hostile, semi-hostile environment in Fort Worth, because I do think there's going to be a lot of burnt orange in the stands, um, you know, I, I think that this is a game that Texas should win, regardless if it's Malik Murphy or Quinn Ewers starting a quarterback. We kind of mentioned that yesterday um, in the storylines, you know, kind of talking about some of the big storylines heading into the game. Um, Texas comes in eight and one, five and one in Big 12 play. Uh, TCU, I believe, four and five and two and four in Big 12 play. You know, Texas 10 point favorite, nine and a half. I actually believe it had shrunk to last time I checked on Caesar Sportsbook. Um, and, you know, I, I think if, Quinn Ewers ends up starting this weekend. You're going to see that line move back up a little bit in, in Texas's favor. Um, but what are y'all's thoughts heading into the game this weekend? This is not a good team. We should win, and we should win convincingly, whether Malik Murphy or Quinn Ewers is the quarterback. And I was very grateful for Jalen Ford saying, we remember last year when they came into DKR and we played a great defensive effort and they still won. And that took us out of the Big 12 title game. And so, ironically, in a funny, the, he didn't say this, but it's interesting to think that Texas is basically where TCU was last year. I mean, not quite, but they're going into this game with a shot at the Big 12 and the playoff, where, you know, Texas obviously wasn't that last year, TCU was. So I think they have the right mindset. This isn't a very good team. And, they should be able to come away with a win. Uh, basically, they should take a page out of the same playbook that they did against Alabama, which was make Jalen Milrow go to his second read. And when he did that, things went bad. Make Josh Hoover go to his second read, and things will also go bad. Although the plus side is Josh Hoover isn't Hercules and can't run like a gazelle. So you have that going for you. So Texas should come. Out of this game, nine and one, heading to Ames to get their first ten win regular season since two thousand and nine. Yeah, um, you know TCU obviously given Texas a lot of problems of late. Have won seven of the last nine meetings between the two, and it's always, you know, a team you got to be a little apprehensive of, especially traveling to Fort Worth. But I completely agree with Tarek. This is a game that you have to win. You have to win it convincingly. I think if Texas really is a top five to seven team, regardless of who's uh, starting quarterback on Saturday, they come out of Fort Worth with a double-digit win. I think they're why I'm optimistic about this week. Uh, there are a lot of different ways Texas can win this football game. Where I think TCU just has like one small sliver margin, and that's going to be you know relying on Texas to cough up the ball. But yeah, I think you you, you kind of got to throw out the history between these two teams because 2023 Texas and 2023 TCU really are not. They, they don't resemble what they've been in the past. And, you know, Tark, you brought it up, but Jalen Ford not forgetting last year. I think Sark sure as hell doesn't forget last year either. Uh, arguably, probably his worst game as the head coach of the University of Texas, just three offensive points. So I expect whoever's at quarterback, we're going to come out, you know, putting the pressure on. And it's going to be, you know, one of those games where if they do jump out to a quick lead, like you saw against Kansas State, I think it's going to be full throttle, 100%. I'm not worried about this team, you know, slowing up because of what we saw against TCU last year. And, you know, they slowed up a couple of times against Houston and Kansas State this year, almost got beaten both of them. So hopefully that mindset has shifted and we can uh, get through a game that's, 
you know, just kind of pretty the whole time. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I'm a little bit more reserved about Texas's chances to potentially blow out TCU or, you know, I guess it seems like in y'all's book from the way you're talking about it that y'all think maybe like a 95 percent chance Texas wins on Saturday. I'd say maybe if you 80. put a percentage chance on it, I'd put 80. I'd give them a 20 percent chance of losing. Yeah, I, I don't. I mean, I understand the skepticism due to the history of the matchup, but I I think last year kind of showed you that, uh, you know, Texas has some real talent on defense and TCU could barely really move the ball against that defense. And they don't have anywhere near the offensive players that they did then. So, and tech, whereas Texas has really flipped the script on offense, especially if Quinn Ewers is there. So, yeah, and, and, I mean, I, I, there, 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 I mean, there are some players uh, that TCU has that obviously can give you some struggle, but uh, Texas should win the game. I feel com- very comfortable saying that. Yeah, I mean, it's going to be a game that, you know, you're nervous all of Saturday just because of what TCU's done in the past. But I, it, it like, like Tark said, I'm probably like an 80, 85% chance they do end up winning. It's one of those games where if they really are, if they are deserving of a big 12, a spot in the Big 12 championship and potentially the college football playoff, this is a game you win and you win handily. So it's, it's one of those things where if Texas goes out and they lose the, the game, it's like, all right, well, we, we might not even had it this year anyway. Because I mean, Sonny Dykes mentioned in his press conference today that TCU is preparing for both um, Malik Murphy and Quinn Ewers, uh, you know, preparing for Texas a quarterback this weekend. So, um, you know, I think that's a natural segue for me. So before I get into the reasons why I think Texas can dominate TCU, as, as we do every week on the show, um, I want to look at – uh, you know, some of the injury updates that we had um, that we had yesterday and also today, I I wrote up something on a couple of reports updating Quinn Ewer's status today. Um, there were, uh, you know, a couple of informative reports that came out that, you know, shed some light on increasing optimism of Quinn Ewer starting this weekend. Um, sounds like Anwar Richardson of Orange Bloods is more optimistic that Quinn will start this weekend than he was on Sunday. Um, he was essentially saying it was like a coin flip that Quinn plays and it's been bumped above that. And, um, then, uh, TFB also reported that Quinn has been throwing better in practice this week. Um, it, you know, better today than it was yesterday. You also had Sark upgrading his status yesterday from week to week to day to day. Um, and then I know that Quinn posted on his Instagram story, something today about, um, you know, him wanting to get out in there and play, getting out there and playing. So, um, I get it. I mean, he grew up close to Fort Worth, um, you know, played high school ball in South Lake, not too far, not too far from even G Carter Stadium. And, um, you know, he wants to lead this Texas team to a championship. And this is his chance. And so um, sounds like his recovery is moving in the right direction. Uh, I saw a report about Jalen Catalan. Uh, he practiced today as well. So that's a good sign He's dealing with that leg injury that's kept him out the last few weeks. Um, I did want to mention something with Jalen Catalan that I didn't say yesterday. Um, I think it was Jerry Hamilton that brought up the interesting point today that, uh, you know, Catalan was at Arkansas for, what, three, four years where with Kendall Bryles, uh, the TCU, the now TCU offensive coordinator, then Arkansas offensive coordinator. So he's seen this veer and shoot system in practice a ton. And so, you know, with Catalan's physicality, his football IQ, um, you know, just his kind of playmaking acumen, I think that getting him back this weekend would be huge. You don't need, I, I think even just getting him in for key downs, getting him back in the safety rotation would, would be really impactful. Um, Keaton Crawford, I would assume that he is likely to play this weekend, but don't have any concrete updates on him beyond the fact that he practiced yesterday, as Sark said in his press conference. Uh, Christian Jones, uh, likely to go this weekend. I know that at one point he was warming up on the sideline last weekend uh had it you know once uh once he had the injury to kelvin banks that kept him out for a couple of plays when they had to bump hayden connor over to uh right tackle or hey sorry excuse me left tackle um and so you know either way though at right tackle i think cam williams played pretty well um i would have faith in him if he gets the second start of his collegiate career you know second start in a row this weekend and um uh otherwise well you had kelvin banks he said 
in he said in player or media availability yesterday that he feels really good physically so it sounds like he's ready to go you know he only missed a couple of snaps so i think he should be ready but for quinn i mean sounds like his injury is headed in the right direction um, or his recovery is headed in the right direction and um sounds like from recent reporting that there's you know things are moving in the right direction and i don't know potentially we'll see what sark says on thursday but potentially could be looking at a likelihood of Quinn you were starting this weekend. I don't want to put the car too far out in front of the horse there. But again, just with the way reports are trending lately, it, it is more optimistic. Otherwise, it, is there anything else that I think y'all would want to see maybe from like the safety rotation with getting potentially Catalan and Crawford back this weekend? I frankly would. I like that they were rotating less. I think that helped. Yeah, I would like to see a little bit more of Derek Williams on the field, maybe in place of Jaron Thompson. And I think you I think you will as time goes on. His snap count decreased. Jaron Thompson's had an uptick last weekend against Kansas State. Um, yeah, but I, I thought Kansas State was more of a Jaron Thompson type of game. That's the type of game where they run the type of offense where that's not going to get Thompson out of sorts. And they just don't, and, and they don't have the team speed that makes you really worry about that. But against TCU, I would worry a little more with their more up tempo, one read offense kind of thing. Yeah, that's yeah. fair. I guess I guess some of TCU's speed this weekend, or some of their, you know, some of their wideouts that having Derek Derek Williams back there can can um, definitely help, especially if TCU is targeting more of the deep stuff this weekend. Um, Okay, so let's go and move in or move on now to, uh, you know, some of the reasons that I came up with two. um, And then through some additional research I did today, I've got two more that I've kind of been feeling out, but I think that I've got a good idea of where I want to go with those. Um, The first one, the first reason why I think Texas can dominate TCU this weekend, and I just think this is the most obvious route for Texas to do so is I just think that Texas is going to easily control the lines of scrimmage on both sides of the ball. Um, I think Texas, you know, the offensive line's playing really well. Um, They've got the best pass blocking efficiency rating in the big 12 in the last three weeks. Um, They also have uh, kind of shown that, you know, there's a lot of depth along this offensive line. You know, Cam Williams coming in, Last week, second highest graded pass blocker on the team among the starting offensive linemen. You know, Kelvin Banks doing a tremendous job. I'd have to go back and check some of the numbers for this week. But heading into the Kansas State game, he had the longest active streak in the Big 12 without uh, like offensive snaps about allowing a quarterback pressure. Christian Jones been playing good football this season. The interior offensive line, you know, Jake Major has been getting healthier. Um, DJ Campbell, I think, just is getting better as the season progresses. Um what what are y'all's thoughts on, you know, Texas, the defensive line, the ability to, I think, win significant battles on both sides of the ball in the trenches? Yeah, I, I think looking towards the Texas defensive line versus the TCU offensive line, I, what worries me a little bit is that, and we've seen this kind of narrative floated around after the Kansas State game, is that, you know, the te- the interior defensive line of Texas might be so dominant that TCU just completely scraps the run. And it's just like, all right, Hoover's going to throw the ball 50 times today, and that's how we're going to push it down the field. And then it's on those safeties that we were talking about and on guys on the outside, Ryan Watts, Manny Muhammad, Terrence Brooks, to step up. But I I do think that – I think Dykes is going to be quick to turn away from the run. I mean, right now they're only rushing the ball 44% of the time, which is 112th in the country. So I would not be surprised at all if, you know, they'll the run, run some outside zone, you know, get it to their playmakers in space. But I would not be surprised at all if TCU ends this game with only like 15, 18 carries and most of their work is done through the air. So that that does, you know, make me a little apprehensive because while we know, you know, Byron Murphy and Tavondre Sweat are absolute space eaters and they also you know are pretty adept at getting to the quarterback. Uh, it, it, Texas hasn't been great at bringing the quarterback to the ground. Better than last year, but still not great. So I, I do think that could be an issue if Dykes is just like, all right, we know we're not going to be able to run it. We're, we're chucking it around the yard from from the from the get go. And we saw Kansas State once they committed to that, really hurt Texas. So 
that's certainly something I'm going to be watching for. No, I, I agree with what Shane is talking about. Uh, one thing that does worry me in this game is the ability to go with the up-tempo offense and also the <clears> – <throat> this is the kind of offense that's very similar to what Oklahoma was running. And as time went on, the defensive tackles kept getting tired because you couldn't rotate as much because if you you know, get a playoff, they can just keep going and going. And it's going to be cold. Well, not, maybe not cold, but you know, nighttime. Are the are we going to be able to rotate as much as we'd like to? Um, that's that's a concern. So hopefully, the answer to that is yes. But if they get going on offense, you're going to have to do that. But I think having Ethan Burke back is going to help so much because the defense is totally different when you have a guy who can really get to the quarterback, and Ethan Burke can do that. Yeah, I mean, being able to collapse the pocket on TCU, I think, is going to be a big thing this weekend because Chandler Morris is the more mobile of TCU's quarterbacks. And uh, it sounds like again, Josh Hoover is probably getting the start this weekend from what Sonny Dykes said. I think Chandler Morris will be available, so that, w- that was interesting. But they're rolling with Hoover. Um, he's got a big arm, but uh, I think I think he's got a lot of arm talent, can throw you know off-platform, things like that, but he's just not very mobile. And so, you know, if, if, you, can, if you can get some pressure – if you can get some pressure on him in this situation, I think Texas is going to find a lot of success on defense. Um, you know, that's a fair point that you bring up, Tarek. You know, if if TCU is finding ways to, you know, get some maybe short and intermediate stuff going in the passing game and, you know, starting to really run up some of the time of possession on Texas, yeah, potentially you could get in a situation where Sweat and Murphy are getting a little bit more tired. You're not able to get other guys on the field, you know, Broad and Collins, uh, Trill Carter, guys like that, and keep the defensive lineman fresh. Um, but, you know, on both sides of the ball in this game, I think that, again, with Texas having such an overwhelming, not only like just I think size advantage and, and athleticism, but I wrap this point up here for this, you know, for my first reason why Texas can dominate TCU. It, you know, on offense, I think TCU, their offensive line, they got some guys that are are doing pretty well that are grading out near the top of the conference. Willis Patrick, senior right guard, doing well. One of the top graded pass blockers in the Big 12. John Lance at center, again, kind of middle to upper tier center in the Big 12. But the rest of the guys, especially left guard Colton Deary, had struggling. Um, they've kind of split time over at left guard, I believe, but he's been their starter for most of the season. Um, and then the tackles, you know, Andrew Coker and Brandon Coleman, I think, again, great out around average middle tier in the Big 12. There's some guys that you can attack here. I, I don't think this line is as good as Kansas no, no, State. <laughs> I haven't seen him at all this year. Um, I know that was the point. That's why I said that. Yeah, man. Um, anyway, I uh, and then on defense, you know, TCU, they're. In a couple of spots, pretty young up front. Um, Demonic Williams is is the guy that knows that is the, is the biggest guy up front. He but about six foot one, three hundred ten pounds. He's kind of a bowling ball, but he's just not he's not clogging up the lanes necessary for TCU to get their linebackers downhill and to be making a bunch of plays or even to be taking on double teams effectively. Um, the ends aren't setting the edge very well in run defense. So you're going to have opportunities to move TCU off the ball up front to, you know, control the great game on the ground and again, give your quarterback time to throw in the pocket. Um, my next point here uh, is TCU str- like struggles running the ball in Big 12 play. Um, TCU has been, I think, average at best running the ball, especially lately. Um, they've kind of struggled to even get to like 150 yards per game. I, I do think they have two pretty solid backs between Amani Bailey, Trey Sanders, Amani Bailey, more better every down back. Sanders using more in short yardage goal line situations is a bigger back than Bailey can run over people. Um, but, you know, I think in the last, what is it, in the last three games, they're averaging around 100, 135 rush yards per game around a clip of four yards per carry. Both are below, well below Big 12 averages this season in Big 12 play. Um, I, I think that while Tarek, you bring up a valid point with TCU, you know, kind of moving the ball fast. I, T, this TCU offense has not been consistent in moving the chains this season. Um, they have a lot of turnover issues. Um, you know, they do convert 
I think like 46% on third down. But they also have, I believe it's the fourth worst number in terms of points per drive in the Big 12 this season. So it's inconsistent for them. Also, don't think, again, they're going to run the ball enough times to tire us out or to control the clock. Yeah, I think it's going to be important for the second level to bring guys down on first contact. I mean, you got JoJo Earl, the former Alabama receiver, um, Savion Williams, John Paul Richardson. Like, these are guys who, they're all a little different. They all have different skill sets, but they're pretty adept at, at yards after the catch. And Texas has been pretty good at, you know, they have some weaknesses here and there. Gavin Holmes, not the best tackler, but I I think getting guys to the ground, you know, on on first contact and having that gang mentality is going to be pretty big. You're going to see a lot of like mesh, a lot of, you know, short crossers. And once those guys, you know, make the catch, it's about getting them down. And, you know, you can give up a first down here and there, but it's those big plays that'll get you beat, which we saw last year against TCU is the, the two deep touchdowns. So, uh, I think it's going to be of the utmost importance to keep everyone in front of you and, uh, you know, bring guys down. And ta- Texas has tackled pretty well. Correct me if y'all think I'm wrong, but I think as a team, they, they, I mean, we've, we saw some pretty lean tackling years in, in uh, the Herman era. So I think this year they've actually been pretty solid. Yeah, they don't – TCU doesn't have that scary receiver this year, the Quentin Johnston or – uh, who was that other guy they had last year? Mario Davis? Tay yeah. Barber. Tay Tay Barber. Or Chris Barber, yeah. Um, and uh, obviously only had Kendra Miller or Max Duggan. So, uh, yeah, if you keep everything in front of you, I think we should be fine. Um, JoJo Earl, I'm disappointed in. He's, like, not a consistent starter and not really doing a, a ton, but maybe this is the game he kind of changes that. I don't know. Yeah, I think the way of receiving threats, J.P. Richardson is their most consistent. He's their leading receiver. Um, Savion Williams, the big guy on the boundary, I think he has some potential. They just haven't really tapped into that yet. Um, he's their third, second or third leading receiver this season. Jared Wiley is also commonly targeted for them at the tight end position. Uh, former Texas transfer. He, uh, um, I think he's, I'm not losing that. I don't know. I'll edit that part out. Anyway, uh, back to my point about the ground game. I was actually overestimating TCU a little bit in the last three weeks there to clip about 100 yards per game, um, but they are around four yards per carry in the last three weeks. So um, that ranks ninth in the Big 12 over that span. Um, and 100 yards per game is is third from the bottom. Obviously, that's not where you want to be in, a, in an offense that emphasizes possession. And, well, this is the part that kind of confuses me about them starting Josh Hoover, but also the quarterback run game. There's a lot of RPOs in this offense and Hoover, while he's a guy that can't throw off platform and I think can throw on the run pretty well. I don't think he's much of a threat using his legs. So um, my next point I wanted to get to here uh, is that I, I just think that TCU turns the ball over too much for them to get out scot free this weekend. You know, Josh Hoover's got seven, Again, seven touchdowns, seven interceptions on the season. Had a couple of interceptions late against Texas Tech that were costly last weekend, including on TCU's potential game-tying drive. Um, I I think this week uh, you could be looking at either like Jade Barron or Jalen Ford coming up with an interception. I'm I'm feeling it for one of them. You know, Jade Barron had that big fumble return for a touchdown last year against TCU. Feels like Ford's due for one too. I mean, the fact that TCU gives up the ball a ton is great because uh, that's where a lot of the concerns come on the Texas side. If Murphy is the guy, that just gives us a little more margin for error because, you know, if Texas gives it up three times, but they also take it away three times, then at that point, you know, depending, you know, what part of the field, but you're you're sitting pretty even there. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, I, I think that's a good point. And that's one of the T- – if TCU wants to win this game – they're going to have to play a super clean game while also forcing some Texas turnovers. And that's why their path to victory is so small because it really has to be perfect on all accounts. Or as Texas can afford to give the ball away because you feel confident that whether it's Barron Sorrell coming off the edge, Jalen Ford in the middle, Michael Taff over the top, like someone's going to make a play. And we've seen it week after week. And 
like you said, Andrew, TCU shown in the proclivity to give up the ball, and I'd expect that to happen once again on Saturday. So how many times does Texas give it up? What's that turnover margin? Who has the edge there? Yeah, sorry, were you asking on that? I was just saying who, whoever has the edge, that's going to oh, dictate oh, oh. the outcome. Okay. If Texas has the edge in turnovers, I, I don't see there's any way this game is very close at all. Yeah, yeah, I agree. If we, it, it, let's say they turn the ball over three times, if we don't turn the ball over at all, I think it's a blowout. Um, but yeah, c- because as I was rewatching the Kansas State game, it was just so weird. It was just eerie how it was almost like we were turning the ball over. It, you almost, in a very sadistic mood, almost thought, are they doing it on purpose just to make it fun? <laughs> it's just the way it happened. Like, okay, turn it over here, score. Turn it over here, score. You know what? This is. Let's do it one more time just to tie it up, and then let's make this a game and see if we can actually win a tough game. It was just like, uh, let's yeah. not go against TCU again. So, and then I, I will I will chime in real quick. I, I do think, and the, I mean, we talked about it at ad, ad nauseum. But the Murphy turnovers, I, I think they're pr- they're easier to clean up. You know, so that's a thing where, where where you could easily see him not if he starts not throw an interception this week. If Sark was able to drill to him, it's okay to take a sack. It's okay to throw it away. Like his turnovers were bad turnovers. And those are things that are, are pretty, you know, easily correctable. At some point, it will happen, whether it's at Texas or it's somewhere else in his collegiate career. And when Murphy doesn't turn over the football, he's he's going to be a damn good uh, power five quarterback. Yeah, he's got a lot of arm talent and special deep ball, and he's got the he's got the physical tools that you look out or look for out of you know, kind of prototypical NFL pro style quarterback. Um. My last point I wanted to get to here, and this isn't one that I bring up very much, but it's definitely something that I noticed when looking through some of the just some of the box score stats, advanced metrics, and just from watching TCU a good bit this season is I think that Texas has a big edge here with like penalties and the hidden yards. I'm not, you know what, throw Big 12 refing out the window, everything like that. I know the Texas fans have some qualms there. Um you know, TCU is one of the more penalized teams in the Big 12 this season, averaging around seven flags a game, around 55 penalty yards, ranks 80th in the FBS. Um, they have not been a super disciplined team this year. It's been everything from false starts to illegal substitutions, um, a lot of stuff on offense just for miscommunications. Um, and I think, you know, again, with Hoover starting this weekend, you can see more of that, especially if Texas is able to put some of the pressure on TCU early. Um, and then on special teams, I mean, TCU is is OK, but I mean, I. I have a number up right here. I'd have to double check this. It says their field goal conversion percentage is 56 and a quarter percent. Yeah. Ranking 118th in the Big 12. I know Griffin Kell has been having some issues this year. Is it really that bad? I have him at 11 for 18 on field goal attempts, 32 of 33 on extra points. OK, so, yeah. Like I said, special teams in the hidden yards. Texas has been better this season. Um, I think that that's one of those things where, you know, maybe you get a blocked punt. Maybe you get a blocked field goal. Maybe you just have the big-time edge. Don't run into the kicker this time. That screwed the that screwed, really screwed us up bad last time we played them. Yeah, well, and avoid getting a punt blocked <laughs> um, in this one. But, you know, Sanborn's been really solid this season on, on a positive note. I mean – I mentioned it in yesterday's show. He's got the highest percentage of punts down inside the 10 yard line in Big 12 play this year. Um, one touchback, and I think that was one that could have been down inside the 10 yard line, too. So it's um, Bert Auburn's been solid lately. You know, four or four last game had some really clutch kicks, including the overtime winner. You know, that potential game winner late had Texas held on late in the fourth quarter. Um, yeah, I think, you know, special teams. How much uh, do y'all think that special teams alone has won us one, one or two games this season? Yeah, I think it, I think it, uh, I was going to say, I think it won a Kansas one game, State, but, but I mean, you had the, they, they blocked the punt. So that can't kind of canceled out all the good Auburn did. But I think special teams was good against Alabama too. Yeah. I think it's hard. Yeah. I think like in totality, like if we're doing NBA win shares here, you can <laughs> give it, you can give it one. Uh, because I mean, yeah, damn good. I know that we were going to win the BYU game either way, but Worthy's punt return kind of sparked things for Texas there. Special teams have been 
been really solid this season. So, and again, it's been a pretty major weakness for TCU. So, again, I don't talk about that part that much, but I thought I should shed some light on it just because TCU is struggling so much there. Um, special teams can win you or lose you a lot of games. So, yeah, this goes back to their margin of error being, you know, so thin in this game. It's like yeah. they, ha- they have to be perfect in things they have not been perfect on at all this year, turning the ball over, staying clean in regard to penalties and special teams. It's like, why, why, why should we expect it? Hey, I gr- granted because they're playing number seven, Texas with, with a chance to make the college football playoff. That's why they'll be perfect this week. But you know, in reality, looking at the data, there's no reason to expect that to happen. Yeah, I agree. Um, so I'll, we'll get into some concerns really quick. We, we've kind of voiced them throughout the video, so I don't think we need to spend too much time on this. Um, you know, I already mentioned turnovers. If Malik Murphy is starting, he's just had too many turnover worthy plays this season. Um, in his two starts, I, I think if he does start this game, he'll be better, but this is a big stage. I mean, he, he hasn't started a road game yet. And his first one would be under the lights in pretty cold, windy weather, I might say, as Tarky said at the beginning of the video. So definitely the worst playing conditions that he would have had so far. Um, I don't think there's any chance of rain, so that that's good. But um, again, for Murphy, yes, TCU isn't turning the ball over as much this season as they were last year, but TCU still got some solid defensive backs back there. Like I said, Bud Clark, Josh Newton, these are some NFL caliber guys. So that would be my first concern. My second one's just very basically... I think TCU, while they don't have the weapons they did last year, they still have weapons. J.P. Richardson is a guy we played before. He was successful against us last year at Oklahoma State. Um, I mean, I think that Jared Wiley, very experienced guy in the Big 12, like he did last year, I'm sure he's going to have a chip on his shoulder in this game. Um, It's worth noting TCU does have some receivers that are out due to injury. Um, I saw Dylan Wright. one of their guys that's gotten starter reps this season is potentially out for the season. I believe Warren Thompson as well and Jack Beck. Um, so that's three guys that um, have gotten at least rotational reps, two of them that have gotten pretty regular reps at, at wide receiver that are out. Um, so that's pretty significant. I still think, though, you know, these TCU guys, like like you said, Shane, they're going to come in with a chip on their shoulder. Hoover is the guy with some arm talent. Texas has been picked apart before. Might I add by like Baylor, uh, Kansas State. We've given up over 300 passing yards in both those games. So it wouldn't surprise me if we give up in the ballpark of 250 to 350 passing yards this weekend with how much TCU is going to pass the ball. That's really all I had for concerns. Is there anything else you all would add on that part? Just win. Yeah, fair enough. I'm like, I don't know. I'm just like, I, I feel like Texas should win this game so much. It's like hard to be like interested in it in a way. <laughs> it's just like, uh, the reason being, it's like, because if you win, I was like, yeah, you beat, a four, you beat a four and five team that's probably not going to a bowl game. If you lose, you lost to a four and five team that's, I'm oh, sorry, a five and a five and five team who's still probably not going to go to a bowl game. <laughs> so it's just, it's like damned if you do damned, if you don't, you know, I, that's fair. I'm not going to take anyone lightly down the stretch though. Yeah. I agree. Oh no, you. that's not what I meant. It's like, you're not taking them lightly. It's more of like, you're really like interested and in feeling like this is going to be like a good game. That kind of a thing. It's just like, uh, yeah. yeah. It doesn't have the same, I think, appeal to it that a game like Iowa State does or when you have Tech at home in the finale with, you know, wanting to just kind of beat them sideways after the Ormark, the McGuire comments last year, the, the loss in Lubbock, all that. And so I get it from that perspective. I think there's going to be a lot of burnt orange in the stands on Saturday. Um, I'm hoping for a fun game, obviously, since I'm going to be there. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I do think that, TCU. I'm confident that TCU's got some guys that that can get it done against us in, in one-on-one coverage in this game. Um, if Josh Hoover is, you know, steady in the pocket, delivering the ball where it needs to be, not turning the ball over too much. I think it can be a close game, 
if I'm looking at it from the perspective of what concerns me. But yeah, I I would agree with you all. And we can get into score predictions now. Or yeah, I mean I I'll say I think we win by double digits. I'll I guess I'll go ahead and give mine. I think we win 38-24. I haven't done my official like preview piece yet, but um I think that the game might be kind of close early on while we're trying to find our identity. And then is is the game where it's on, we start kind of really controlling the controlling the line of scrimmage. I think TCU with some of the injuries they have and just again, some of the limited weapons, at least compared to last season, that eventually our defense is going to start figuring out. And I think we're going to pull away in the second half in this game. I got a 34 20 Texas. I, I, I do. I, I think Hoover is going to have some drives where he finds some success moving the ball down the field, but I don't think they're going to be able to stack those drives. So as long as the Texas offense doesn't have a massive lull like it did in the second and third quarters against Kansas State, I think they'll be able to score enough. Uh, I think you score over 30, you should win this football game. And uh, we, we said at the top, I feel, yeah, I feel more that would definitely feel more confident with Quinn out there. But I think this is a game that Malik can uh, can win as well. So whomever gets to start. I think Texas should win this game. And, and yeah, I got it at a 14-point margin as well as you, Andrew. I'm going to go Texas 38, TCU 17. We got to start having some bigger uh, some bigger discrepancies in our, in our scoring margins because it's getting hard to figure out who's winning each week. Um, <laughs> I got it last week. I'll sorry, say I'm that. Sorry, I'm, so, I'm sorry that we've been watching the same games. Well, yeah, sure, we, were, we were pretty on point last week. Yeah, we were at least how the game ended up. I thought that we were going to be pretty wrong early in the third quarter. But yeah, yeah, yeah true. How it goes sometimes. You know, this they, is they one probably watched. They watched our show. and They said, no, we we, we got to we got to make this closer for. Shane. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> uh, it this is kind of one of those show me stats, I think, too, you know, Shane, you mentioned that TCU probably shouldn't be putting up too many points on us, but you know that TCU hasn't won a single game this season when their opponent scores over 20. So yeah, that's another the, their margin for error is pretty dang thin as we as we go through everything we've talked about this video. Yeah. Anyway, um, so yeah, Tarek, uh, I think the scoreboard this season. So what are we at? Nine games. Um, Shane, you have four. I have three. Tark, you have two. We've run into a stretch of the season where the margins of victory haven't been quite as large, except the one game that you were less optimistic about was BYU, I think, was the one. And we actually ended up winning that by a pretty good margin. Um, anyway, I y'all got anything else before we get up and rolling here? No, excited. I think... I, with what Tarek said about this game, I think if you're a Texas fan, I think I think you got to be excited for every game. I mean, we haven't had a team this good in 14 years. Granted, every Saturday isn't fun, but you're right in the thick of it, and this is all you oh, can no, be I, I, I would disagree with that. <laughs> Which part? Oh, uh, I think every Saturday has been fun. Um, it, it's more of mm. TCU's had better – I don't know. I it's been more of like TCU did something most years that like made you worry, but it's just like okay, like if Texas just plays a decent game, they should win. They don't have to yeah, play great. Yeah. That's and I haven't been I, able I, to say that for a long time. That's yeah, where it's just yeah. like this doesn't have the usual TCU angst. That's true. The purple, I, I, the, pur, uh, the purple haze, as it were. I think my point is just. Uh, you got to just appreciate the journey because there have been so many Novembers over the past decade where it's like the games are, are almost meaningless to any conference or national implications and you're in the thick of both of it. So, uh, yeah, that's all I got really. And let's pray that USC beats Oregon and ends their title hopes this week. That'd be great. I don't think that's happening, but I think it could actually. Maybe, but I don't think the USC's defense is going to be able to stop Oregon ever this weekend. But 
Patrick yeah, the, the problem isn't really with their defense. It's can they not give the ball away on offense? Like, they only yeah. gave it away once last last week. Yeah, I mean, I think they would have won if they if they didn't. And they had too many penalties on offense too. Yeah, I think their defense can give up forty eight. They can still win that game. Yeah. All right. Well. Anyway, for uh, Andrew Miller, for Gore, for Shane Black from BlackMeadLines.com, that's pretty much it. Welcome. Welcome. Welcome.